background which is that at least eight of my family members are African American. Uh, and my daughter is also a little So they were, were interestingly mixed. Uh, I've been interested in uh, exploring issues of multiculturalism in things that I write. I know that the other side is dark. Uh, I just finished a book about Titanic, which is a multicultural version of the Titanic, set mostly in New York. And that's what I do. And I'm also, because other people will forgive me if I don't mention this. I'm writing a kind of serial best, serial white pop. Which is set in Restoration Era England. Which is, which is set in Restoration Era England. Thomas doesn't have <laughs> Well, I am just Thomas Swallow Hercules. You pronounce my name really well. You were a few Americans who do. <laughs> Thank you so much. That's <laughs> really good. Oh, there you go. Uh, uh, I'm from the Netherlands. I just got my uh, first novel out in uh, Living Q in, in, in the Netherlands. My first war novel out here in America called Hex. Um, and I had to do a lot with um, uh, historical background changes because originally the novel set in the Netherlands and for the international markets uh, it's been relocated to an American setting. And so the whole historical background of the novel changed, which was an awesome process to go through actually. It, it was based on the market perspective, but also on actually to gain more vulnerability um, with, you know, and familiarity with the American audiences. Uh, and I guess I'll talk about that more. And I also uh, want to go for this year. Thank you. <laughs>
English is German. No, the other way around, not that good. <laughs> German to English. So what you've described in various ways is very much the process of translation, which I found really interesting with yours, Thomas. Is it Thomas or Thomas? Thomas. Thomas, okay. Um, because usually the translator's job is to at least, not, not just to do word by word translation, but also to translate in such a way that the reader can make sense and hear and so forth. But you've got a huge step past that. Mm -hmm. So did you do, A, did you do your own translation work? Or did you rewrite the book in English? And then I'm curious about the problems and resistance that you found as a writer doing that and that people were having to the book that caused well, first, why I did it was because um, it's a scary story. I'm not getting all these messages from readers in Holland when it was published that they had to sleep with the lights on. And I wanted to go with that same reaction in America and wherever it's published now. Um, because that's what it was about. You want to frighten your readers. And to, to actually scare your readers, you need to create this perfect sense of familiarity and then destroy it, of course. Um, so if the book were to set, for instance, that I was in a book that was set in Azerbaijan, a country of which I unfortunately know not so much about them. I was wondering about the pronunciation of these names, and I was wondering about what's the norm for these people, and that creates a distance and not a familiarity with it. So that's why I did it. The way we did it is we, um, I rewrote the book for an American setting. I chose an American setting at that time, well, it kind of you know, resembled the Dutch setting in the book. I chose upstate New York. Um, the Green Brown and Coffee Novel as well, of course. Um, and I translated, translated it. I really worked with translation into my own voice, which I can do in English. Uh, I mean, it's I'm translated into Chinese now, and I have no idea if you have no control over that. Uh, but, um, so, it's an ongoing process. And then you're back and forth and back and forth. And then, I mean, I wrote the book in four and a half months, and this whole transitional process, actually, to uh, almost a year. Okay. Yeah.
again, it's not so much about truth, it's about sort of like that, the, the sort of like schemata that people have about their, their world and how those two interact in the future. And I think that's true about really any uh, profession or any area of expertise. Um, it's, it's very different to be that than it is to um, experience it from the outside. And I think that's one of the, the things that authors in general have this major challenge you know, diving into because it's always, you know, the, the, the struggle between stereotypes and typical portrayals and, you know, what is it actually, you know, to ring a little bit truer than that. That's something I'm interested in, like, I know you have a few different books that you write, so feel free to talk about this in the context of any of them, but particularly with Whitehall, the restoration, whereas doctors, we have this very clear cultural idea of what a doctor is, but that's quite a recent career. When you're dealing with the history that's been around for a while, people have ideas of it, it's had time to fossilize, but also to be forgotten. How do you find making it believable and accessible when people have a very thin background, but well, I point back there to an example I think Titanic is an endeavor there. Because everyone knows about Titanic. And what they know is a uh, white classes uh, cishet version of Titanic, which was more or less made up in the metric zone between when the ship sank and when the people started writing these. Lovely sad stories about my dear I'll see you in New York. And I I love the Titanic that I look at these stories and I went and and started trying to find other stories. Uh, like for instance, Victor Julio, uh, Ben Luckenheim's uh, ballet. Uh, who Ben Guggenheim famously uh, said that uh, he and his ballet were dressed in their best and prepared to go down like gentlemen. We didn't know until relatively recently that Victor Julian was having a look. And it makes a whole different story. Um, Jack Johnson was supposed to go to the Titanic. That makes a whole different story. So what you know, I try to do is blend the story that everybody knows and the story that nobody knows and see how they talk to each That's that's very interesting too. I think I was mentioning to Carlos earlier. I had the interesting experience of someone anyway. <laughs> interesting experience of reading at the same time Nikki French's Blue Monday, which is fairly standard contemporary murder mystery. And Better on Adventures, Rivers of London, which is written at about the same time, set around the Mississippi Rivers of London, and is a police procedural with magic, but they both start from completely different default assumptions about what everyone in the book looks like. When they say what someone's background is, when they say what someone's name is, when they say whether someone's attractive or not, hugely, it was really interesting to read them side by side. And yeah. that was something that's... Seven always identifies people as white, never been as Anything else. <laughs> it, was, it was two pretty much completely different worldviews on a really uh, interesting lower level of the plot story that was being told, which I was interested in because often we have that assumed or shorthand background. Everyone knows about the Titanic. Everyone knows. No one knows about a particular historical background. So that question of if you're coming into a genre or into a topic where there is a very strongly culturally known background, where we've been trained by everything that we've read to know how things happen. How do you deal with that as a writer, or how do you see writers dealing with that in a way that doesn't hold up the story, so that you don't spend time going, okay, here is the actual background of everyone on the Titanic, but presumably you want to talk about what's going on in their heads, or here is the history of upstate New York, for those who you come to this version of the story. So that you're not writing a book of history or lectures. How do you deal with that? It's a big question, and people deal with it variously. You know, I, I, one of the things uh, I work on is, is video games, and I was the writer on a Lewis and Clark video game, so I read all the fiction around Lewis and Clark as, as part of the background, and it's it's too book horrendous. Like it's a it's a bad genre. <laughs> like, there aren't very books yet about Lewis and Clark. Please write one. Um, but but uh, there's a book um, called I think. So, so I think we're pronouncing the name now Chicago Way, but it's, you, you, 
pronounce that book, Sacagawea, if you know the way to spell by Anna Waldo, I think it is. And it has, for every you know, paragraph, it has a paragraph to a paragraph and a half of research right beneath it in footnotes. And so it is you know, just this thick historical document that's almost unreadable. And, and the, the fiction is terrible. Boy, what a great resource, actually. Are the strengths are fascinating. I was going through it, I was like, oh my god, this person knows so much and writes so badly. You know, so it's like, <laughs>
choose to omit that actually create I think as um, a writer, it's fantastic to actually have an advantage because your readers, you know, I tend to break imagination usually, right? Um, I have an example. Um, the story that one of you have last year was called The Day the World Turned Upside Down. Um, and I mean, you have awards, it's an award for science fiction, right? I don't write science fiction. I don't read a lot of science fiction as well. I'm more from a um, horror or magical realism background. Um, and it's literally about, you know, gravity turning around, the world turns upside down, and the earth's surface. But I use it as a metaphor for um, uh, the internal world of a guy which is done by a girlfriend, and uh, his world turned upside down, basically. He you walks know, in the couch and he has a pulse to the ceiling. Um, and say the goldfish, and it's pretty good goldfish, right? The girlfriend's a story. <laughs> <laughs> science fiction people were like, yeah, but how does it work? Where are you? Where's the gravity? Well, I mean, it, it doesn't work, it doesn't add up, and physically it's, it's wrong. But I didn't care. I mean, this was a story about a guy who was heartbroken and he didn't bring a goldfish back. Um, and by actually subtracting, you know, um, the reader, well, subtracting is the wrong word, but like, you know, um, not paying attention to the physics, but to the story, to the, the you know, the heartache, uh, the, the goldfish. Um, that actually makes the reader attach to the story in a way that uh, you don't need to explain all that background. I mean, everybody can imagine what the world would look like if it flips upside down and just, you know, <laughs> was around himself uh, and kind of, you know, uh, does a trick for you. And everyone has an imagination. So you don't really have to give the, um, the technical background. As long as the story itself is good enough and touches, you know, the emotions and heart of the reader. Good enough is the question, though, right? You know, like, where, where, where does it change? Because in preparation for this panel, I, I read, read the beginning of the metamorphosis. You know, the first line is that Gregor Sansor wakes up from an easy dream. He finds his turn into a gigantic insect. Well, it, it, it's probably you've probably seen these YouTube clips of um, um, there's a couple of guys playing basketball. And you're following the body count, times the dolls pass, and you don't see the monkey that actually walks on the street, the guy in the suit and that, you know. If, it's, if you just pay attention to one thing in the story, and pay attention to it strongly enough, you don't care so much about the rest, right? Yeah. Um, and I think if, if that thing, like following the ball or the basketball field, that keeps you focused, and, and that's meant for it, and the story itself keeps you focused strong enough, uh, whatever it is, when, you know, whether it's, um, just a great heroine with a great um, um, emotional background. If anything that's strong enough to you know, pay attention to, um, that will capture the reader. Yeah. And you won't miss the other thing. You, you kind of have to know that the reader gets to see in this particular story. And um, I just don't know. The world trade upside down. That's not quite the right title. Uh, because, because it was not a was about the, the human being. And in Dutch life, everybody wants to see sex. We know about the very bad art, we know about the and so we give it to the comic people. And, uh, <laughs> yes. And, and there, was a, there was a tough thing in Titanic because every Titanic fan wants to have a trip. Um, there, there, is, there is a couple of scenes in the movie that Cameron put in just because they need to see the boat. Well, they need to see the boat. They never see the boat. So I gave them a let's see the boat scene, which is the tour. And the first boat, they get completely less. And the second boat is really late at night. And young people uh, is legally blind, so she can't see anything. And the other that is way too worried about what's going to happen to her to think about it. So they just notice things, and, and then they notice, they're noticing the famous things. And so the reader gets the tantalizing bits of Titanic that, um, that it's that, like, OK, here's the grand staircase. You've seen it before, you're seeing it again. Because that's, that's it. That's interesting because as an illustrator, I'm going to
uh, leaving things out for the viewer to fill in from their own imagination. Yeah. And it sounds like in that case, if everyone has seen Titanic and is waiting for the tour, they're probably pretty capable of filling in the blanks mm -hmm. between the highlights that you've But nobody, nobody ever mentions how it smells. So I'm not allowed to have it. So, um, Fresh paint. <laughs> Um, you, you also have to know what your audience is reading for. Mm -hmm. Because, for example, somebody who's reading a Titanic story is going to be reading with certain things in mind, where somebody who's reading a science fiction story is going to be reading something for something completely different. And so, like, the details that you choose to include, the details that you choose to omit, are going to be completely different based on who your audience is and, like, what the emotion they're seeking is. Because, for me, I'm a science fiction reader. I like a sense of wonder stuff. Um, I have very little patience for fantasy as a, because of like the deep descriptions of the background and the, I'm like, okay, your trees. <laughs> Scare them away because you cannot avoid people coming to live in your town, of course. But 
Um, so what I do is I try to build, build inside it, so the house, so you know, please don't come here, it's kind of nasty here, and then it doesn't work, so we have people in town, spot the witch at some point, and then there's of course the chapter where the, the, the info dump chapter, of course, where um, they've seen the witch, they've been scared out of events, they've cursed for life now because they live in town now. Um, and then I have a historical background like, oh, it's if you weave that into the actual exciting storytelling, that's, I think, a really good way to do that. <coughs> Not only play with the reader's expectations, actually, and raise that. How do you find dealing with a, a, an ultimate, well, not ultimate, but an unusual version of, say, the Titanic or why not? It's, it's with my age now, and frankly, I'm nervous that a multicultural Titanic story about the survivors is going to be eaten alive by people's expectations that we're going to see uh, Kate and Leo again. Um, and we'll see. Uh, I, I think I think you always have to be pushing the envelope a little bit, and if you're lucky, you might be pushing the envelope too much. And if you're unlucky, next year I'll be saying it's our book. <laughs> <laughs> um, that I, I was I was convinced the book before that would never be finished. Because it it was it was pushing a a similar method and that's a different book award. So who knows? I don't. Well, that's interesting because we've talked a lot about how power goes about clever ways of approaching the tropes and so forth. I'm also interested in examples, possibly from books you've read where it really didn't work or where you struggled with it, but sometimes they're easy to find. But Techniques where you found yourself struggling with trying to get a particular piece across, trying to make it believable. I find it really interesting. I've been hanging around the fringes of Regency romance writers lately, and a lot of them are very, this, this is the way it was historically. We're struggling a bit with this book that was written in the era because they're using this word, which we know people didn't <laughs> So that's, that's a fascinating one for reader expectations. Like, no, no, definitely, definitely was never like that in history. Like, but Jane Austen says, <laughs> <laughs> so, examples where you either run aground on people's expectations or where you're still looking for a technique to carry off something that you really want to do in this space. Yeah. 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 Um, because I think that, that comes back to the, the idea of a contract that you create with your reader, you know, in terms of what genre it is, I think can play into that, but more generally in terms of the language that you use and the expectations you use. So if I say my main character is a human, and I don't say anything other than the character is human, that's going to come with a suite of expectations, of symbolic ideas of what constitutes a human. And so if I have that human then, so if the book I'm writing right now uh, is Planet Havana, where uh, this clone of Fidel Castro is shot up into space and tries to establish a commie pinko paradise in outer space because he can't survive them. <laughs> yeah, it's a point of And so, so in, in the middle of a novel, I want to have basically the space jump where, you know, I, I want to have, you know, Casper basically make a leap from one place to another through vacuum. And so I started doing research on how long a person could survive in vacuum. And it's not nothing, but it's not 30 seconds. You know, it's, it's, there's, a, there's a very small space, you know, where there's oxygen stops coming here, and you pass out first, and you're, Tongue gets microwaved. It's pretty awesome. Uh, so, you, know, uh, you know, to me, it's like I never established anything other than Castro is just sort of like a clone dude, and so I have to follow very rigorously the the, the, the physiological results of being in vacuum. And so, to me, that's that's the sort of contract that I've made. You know, I said he's clone, but a clone human, not a clone superhuman. Anyway. So, so I think that's where I sort of begin with the contract. Like I've got this ludicrous premise. But, but I'm sticking to, I say he's human, and so that, there's one that doesn't like, cling to uh, veracity and, and, and biology. Yeah, I'll, I'll save most of this for the next panel, which is about um, something completely different. That there is a method <laughs> in Tim Towers and, and Stranger Ties where he the, the basic the basic premise is that magic is real in uh, 1718 in the Caribbean 
and, and you know, go with it. Uh, but he does a, a climactic sword fight um, with, with somebody doing magic in the background. And people are being run through and nothing happens to them because they're magically protected. But he does this. He knows about sword fighting and he knows about ships and he's doing it on a ship in a gale. So everybody's going up and down like this and they're being blown across the deck and uh, spars are coming out and, and he, had, he knows the name for each star and he tells you. And he, he tells you um, how the sword fight is going. I know sword fights too and he's got it absolutely right. And there's this level of specificity that is completely convincing and he could tell me anything. He could have, I don't know, Albert Einstein, as he has later, Albert Einstein here in the sky and I would just go with it because he's got the sea and the ship and the sword fight going on. So specificity saves me. That's interesting. <laughs> I, I really enjoy reading the Burn Cycle, but the first time I read it and the first time I read any of the students, I'd get to various points and I'd get really angry because I was, he had, I, I was completely, I believed everything he was telling me, but he came out with something ridiculous. I was like, this, this is, this is. Yes. <laughs> and then I'd be on the phone at work on hold, like, I'm just going to check this out. And everything that I got angry about was completely true, which I think he did to annoy readers so that he wouldn't check up on the things that you're like, yes, yes. Sounds possible because some of them he made up. <laughs> but it has to be not only true but believable. Um, I did a book about Shakespeare. Everybody knows everything about Shakespeare, right? uh, except except it's maybe not true. So I had I had a guy who told this whole story, who knew everything about Shakespeare, just the way all the readers knew everything about Shakespeare, and then. Um, the evidence was piling up, and it was piling up, and it was piling up. And 